and then I'm going to try and center these needles using what I have on my right hand controller here. Okay, so I'm flying, I'm rolling to the right, and what happens is since the control power is so small, I have to be very careful about the inputs I make, and I need to fly it as gently as possible. If I put in large inputs, it will just overshoot. So again, the needles are currently lined up, but they keeps on moving around since you're, the path that you're trying to fly is constantly changing. So no matter how good I am at centering the needles, I need to constantly work to do that. So now I'm at 150 feet altitude, about 100 feet from the landing site. And so far so good. But this thing can, just, it can easily get away from you. You need to stay on top of it at all times. So now I'm 40 feet from the landing site, 100 feet. Altitude. So this big and red circle here is the landing site. That's the landing site coming into view. And 20 feet from the landing site. That's 60 feet altitude. So I'm almost there. 30 feet altitude. 25 feet. So I'm making very small changes now. So I touched down 20 feet from where I need to be. I really wanted to be within 15 feet. And since I was spending so much time trying to explain things, I fell <laughs> a little bit behind. So, and I, so what this tells you is that it, this really needs your undivided attention. You need to be focused <laughs> on this and nothing but this. And you need to be constantly making small changes, uh, reacting to what's going on. In addition, a real pilot, real astronaut would want to be looking outside when we're making cross checks, which you know, right. I, I had almost no time to do that since I was uh, also talking. So in, in, in the real thing, what would happen is the, the commander would be flying this by himself or herself, and then their co-pilot would be talking to uh, mission control, looking out the window and giving information to them. So this really is supposed to be a two-person task. The way we do the experiments is only for a one, only one person because we're having them do only a small set of tasks. So. That's what it should look like, and I don't know if you've got pictures out the window, if you could have been able to see the scenery kind of moving around. Right. And you were saying, just talk a little bit about how this is a representation of the current design for Altair? So this is uh, one of the design cycles, so there are uh, numerous design cycles over the life of, of the vehicle design. Uh, right now, this is design cycle three, and that has only basic information about the mass of the vehicle, the size, the geometry, where the windows are, uh, how big the engines are, for example, how big are the little jets that you use to control the vehicle. Some of the details, like the actual control system design or the displays, are still not determined, so we've come up with these ourselves using our own best judgment and what we know from Apollo. And we evaluate them, learn what's good, what's not so good, we make improvements, and that goes into the next iteration. At some point, as the design cycles get more and more mature, all of these things will get incorporated into them, and then the ability to make changes gets harder and harder as you get more and more closer to the actual uh, uh, building of the vehicle. Right now, we have the luxury of being pretty far away from that point, so we can do research and figure out early on what things need to be improved. And earlier on in the design cycle you are, the easier it is and less expensive it is to make changes. Once you start bending metal, uh, it starts to get more and more uh, difficult to do that. Thank you. All right.